And everybody said, yeah. Good evning, everyone. I pray the Lord bless us abundantly, tremendously today in Jesus' name. That the Lord grant us understanding in his word. We become better leaders and better workers in Jesus' name. I love your amen. Can you say that again? Father, we thank you for our workers' uh, training tonight. Thank you for your people in all kinds of weather, whether it's raining or sunshine. We know that your people are always there. And we pray, Lord, you bless the faithfulness of your people in Jesus' name. Because happy in your work, fruitful in your work. And we pray, Lord, that the knowledge of the truth, first of all, will set us free. And then all the people we are ministering to will set them free in Jesus' name. I pray that everyone here today, without exception, will be rewarded abundantly for faithful service. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see now. We're coming to Matthew chapter 3. And in Matthew chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7 all through to verse 10. Once again, I want to remind you that as workers and leaders, we are in training and we're preparing ourselves for the people we're ministering to. I want to remind you once again that even though we have repented, we need to tell the world what repentance is all about. And we need to help them understand what is true repentance, what is false repentance. And then as they repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, great will be the multitudes that will turn to the Lord through you. And as you turn them from, right, right, from their sin unto righteousness, I pray that you will not miss your reward in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? See how direct he was. And see how pungent and pointed he was. And see how direct as he spoke to them. He wasn't looking at notes. He wasn't looking at outline. He was looking at the people. And he saw them when they came. And when he saw them, oh, those are Pharisees. Those are Sadducees. He was looking up. And he had eye contact with the people that were coming. And he said, generation of vipers. He told them the truth, not about historical things. He told them the truth about themselves. And now he said, you're coming. What's the purpose of your coming? Are you running away from the wrath to come? Are you fleeing from the wrath to come? Look at verse 8. Bring forth, therefore, therefore, if you are running from judgment... If you want to escape judgment, if you flee from the wrath to come, if you are coming because you mean business, therefore bring forth fruits, meat, suitable for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves. He knew what they were thinking, and he was going to point at their action. He was going to point at their thoughts. He was going to point at their lifestyle. And seek not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, That God is able of these tools. He was referring to people they were referred to as hard-hearted Gentiles. You think the Gentiles are hard. You think the pagans are hard. You think those idol worshippers are as hard as stone. God is able of these stone, gentle stones to raise up children even for unto Abraham. And now also, did I tell you that the wrath was coming? Don't think it is far away. He said, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. 
not only one tree, all the trees as one axe of judgment that was coming. Therefore, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down, is hewn down, and cast into the fire. Sometimes you will wonder when you hear these preachers in the Bible, and you read about their message, you see how much they pack into one message. And you see how much that is said here, there's a lot there. Tonight we're looking at repentance and faith, the only way of escape. The repentance and faith, the only way of escape. True repentance with faith in Christ. It's the only way of escape from eternal wrath, from the wrath to come. True repentance, what is that? It is turning away from all known sin. Anything you know as sin, anything you know as wrong deed, anything you know as evil, repentance is turning away from them. And it means a change of mind, a change of mind concerning your past wrong attitude, a change of mind concerning your past wrong action, a change of mind concerning your past wrong belief. They were thinking in themselves, that was their belief, we are children of Abraham. If anybody is going to perish, that will not be us. And he wanted them to understand that repentance was a changing of their mind, even from that wrong thinking and belief. It's a change of direction from the past life. And when we think about and we talk about repentance, it includes sorrow for sin. Sorrow for sin, that is, you now realize this is wrong. I've been walking against God. I've been talking against God. I've been living against God. And because of that, you have sorrow for sin, which is associated with that repentance. It is such sorrow that causes you to hate the sins of your past life. You hate those sins now. Whether, they jump, whether John the Baptist is there or John the Baptist is not there, because of the sorrow for sin you have, you hate the sins of your past life. It leads to confession, confession of the sin and totally turning away with all your heart. Now, mere confession is not repentance. Mere confession without hatred for sin is not genuine repentance. There are people that have regrets. That's not repentance. There are people that have remorse. That's not repentance. There are people that will just open their mouth and confess, we've done this, we've done this. Or they might even say we're sorry. But that's not real repentance. Let me show you. There are people that have what is called false repentance. We're looking at Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. We're reading from verse 27. Exodus chapter 9, verse 27. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, What did he say? I have sinned this time. Moses, can I confess to you? Aaron, can I confess to you? I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous. I and my people are, were what? Wicked. That's confession. But there's no repentance there. You see it now. Look at verse 28. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. Oh, you think the man now has come to repentance. Somebody comes and he confesses. Somebody comes and he says, I have seen. I am wrong. God is righteous. The word of God is true. I believe the Bible. I've gone astray. I will do this. I will do this. I will do that. Look at verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart and he and his servant. So we understand just mere confession 
That doesn't mean the fellow has repented. We're looking at Numbers. Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. We're reading from verse 34. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have seen. Again, that's confession. That's confession. Must go beyond that confession. I have seen. And then he said, For I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now, therefore, look at this, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. And the angel had just said, Your way is perverse before me. And because of that, I came to withstand you. And I came with the sword. I would have killed you. I would have speared. I would have left your ass. But now, see what you've done. Where you're going is not right. And then he said, I have sinned. If you don't like me to go. Why would the angel come with a sword in the hand if he wanted you to go? You see, there are people like that. They would say, they have sinned. And yet, oh God... Can I still do it? Will you permit me? I don't hate that sin. I don't reject that sin. I'm not going, how, what, how can I live without that wrong pleasure, that fleshly pleasure? There's no repentance there. We're coming to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're reading from verse 24. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, is another person. It says, And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Well, if you stopped there, you might think, that man repented after all. If somebody repents, shouldn't God forgive? After all, they are said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. But look at verse 30. Then he said, I have seen, yet honor me now. I have seen. For Samuel, you understand? I'm a king. I deserve some honor. I deserve some respect. And so, even though I have seen, honor me now before the people. So, look at chapter 24 and verse 16. For Samuel, chapter 24, verse 16. And it came to pass, when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice. What did he do? And wept. Ah, this man has repented. Look at him. But look at the next verse. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. It's like I realize now, I'm a sinner. I've done evil. I've rewarded you evil, but you have done good. And he wept. But what happens? David should now just relax because see the man, he has now repented. Look at chapter 26. In chapter 26, verse 2. Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziv, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziv. He was still running after David, but he confessed the other time but after that confession, it's just a momentary confession. He was still pursuing David. Verse 21. In verse 21, then said Saul. What did he say? Say it aloud. 
I have seen, return my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes. This day, behold, I have pledged the fool, I have erred exceedingly. When you hear people confess, we must not just decide that's repentance. Does their repentance and confession, does it make them to hate the sin and to turn away from that sin? And they so hate that sin like poison that there's no way they want to go back there again. Chapter 28, chapter 28, verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit. It's now get, getting into another kind of sin. It's now familiar spirit issue. And then he said, That I may go to her and inquire of her. And the servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that has a familiar spirit at end of. And Saul disguised himself. What he did disguise himself? He knew it was wrong. He knew I mustn't go this way. He knew when he started the kingdom, he got rid of all the familiar spirit people in the land. And now he disguised himself and he put on all that raiment and he went and two men were seen and he came to the woman by night and said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me, bring me him of whom I shall name unto thee. Uh, we'll see that uh, these uh, references we have read, they show us that just somebody saying, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, uh, doesn't mean they have really repented. And false repentance does not receive uh, forgiveness. False repentance does not receive uh, divine favor from God. False repentance cannot bring eternal life from God. The wrath of God will still come on such people that say they have repented and yet there's no hatred for sin, there's no sorrow for sin. They only regretted the consequence of the sin they committed. We're looking at the word tonight, repentance and faith, the only way of escape. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able. Our God is able. My God is able. I said, My God is able. He's able to do all things in your life in Jesus' name. Don't say, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. There are three things we're looking at. Number one. The depraved condition of the religious without repentance. The depraved condition of the religious without repentance. Number two, the divine call to repentance and reconciliation. The divine call to repentance and reconciliation. Number three, the distinctive character of righteousness after repentance. The distinctive character of righteousness after repentance. Number one, please tell me number one. Say it as if you are the one preaching. The depraved condition of the religious 
without repentance. As preachers, we need to know the people we're preaching to. As soul winners, we need to know the people we are winning to the Lord. As leaders and workers in the kingdom of God and the church of the living God, we need to know the state of our audience. And our preaching should be direct. Our preaching should reach the people. She reach their hearts. They should understand that the preacher knows them. The preacher knows their lives. The preacher knows their condition. And the preacher knows that this must happen if they are coming into salvation. The depraved condition of the religious without repentance. What did John know about them? John the Baptist. What did he know about these people? Number one, they were Pharisees and Sadducees without penitence or sorrow for sin look at this chapter 3 matthew verse 7 when you saw many of the pharisees and sadducees come to his baptism they had their tradition let's add john's baptism they had their opinions let's add john's baptism they add their self-righteousness. Let's add John's baptism. And they add their pride and their hypocrisy. Let's add John's baptism. He said, no, that will not work. You have to take off the dirty clothes before you put on the new clothes. You have to take off the wrong ideas before you bring in sound doctrine. These people, Pharisees and Sadducees, were they penitent? Did they change? Just because they came to the baptism. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him. He would show them a sign from heaven. A repentant person doesn't tempt the Lord. A repentant person will not come and tempt preachers. Somebody who has repented and who hated the sin he was committing before and is so grateful that God has now forgiven him. God has now saved him and God has turned his life around. Will not be going around tempting preachers and tempting pastors and tempting people. You see they had not repented. They were still their old self. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of prophet Jonas and he left them and departed. He would not even pay attention to them anymore. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were still the same. Coming from chapter 3, coming to chapter 16, no change. Let's look at verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Those people, they were not repentant. They were not repentant. They just thought, let's come into religion. They were religious, but there was no repentance. Look at verse 12. Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see, there are people that come to church. The people that come to crusade, they had their erroneous ideas about getting to heaven. They had their erroneous doctrine about how to please God. And those things are still there. I will say if you want to have Jesus Christ, Jesus is love. Jesus is power. Jesus is a miracle worker. Jesus can do all things. Raise up your hand. They raise up their hands. Nothing touches their ideas, their opinions, and their false doctrine, and the false way they are going. And then come forward, they, they, they come forward, and then confess. We even repeat, we say, repeat after me. And then they say, those things, I have seen, I have seen. Just like those other people that were read in the Bible, I have seen. And then they go back, and they go back to the same error, to the same ideology, to the same tradition. There's no repentance there. There's no salvation there. Now we come back to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And we're reading here from verse 7 again. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7. We're looking at these people. And we're looking at uh, what depravity they are. 
that the evil did not deal with as I said he came to the baptism but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism he said unto them what did he say to them? I said what did he say to them? O generation of vipers here's another thing about them they might be going quietly like vipers, like snakes, but the poison is inside them. That poison, the original sin that is inside them, that makes them to say and to do what they do, that thing is still there. The preaching and the call to repentance must touch that. They must understand inside there's evil, inside there is uh, dirt, inside there's pollution, inside there's degradation. And if we're going to come to Christ, if we're going to escape judgment, this poison of the asp, of the viper must go but how about it for these people chapter 12 matthew chapter 12 we're reading from verse 34 verse 34 oh generation of vipers how can ye being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh if you follow the Pharisees and the Sadducees throughout Matthew, throughout Mark, and throughout Luke and John, you see what they were saying about Jesus Christ. You know, we'll be studying John, you see, he has a devil. Why are you listening to him? He's casting out devils by Beelzebub. That thing in them was still there because they say, oh, generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? They never could speak any good things, even to the point of the cross that uh, Pilate said, what evil has he done? Why are we going to crucify him? I find no fault in him. They said, if he were not a malefactor, if he were not a sinner, we would bring him to you. Crucify him. He said, go and crucify him yourself. I'm going to crucify somebody I've not found fault in. They said, if you don't crucify this man, you're not his, a friend to Caesar because somebody who makes himself a king is competing with Caesar. They were still having that nature of the viper inside them. That they came to baptize Baptism did not mean they were repenting. And we need to understand this, that the nature in the man, the depravity in the man, the evil in the man, if the thing is still staying and abiding there, we must preach and we must help them and lead them until they understand what repentance is all about. Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 23. Matthew chapter 23. We're looking at verse 33. And you know, here now we're coming near to the edge of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And see their condition? We're coming from Matthew chapter 3. We've gone through to Matthew chapter 12. We're now coming to Matthew chapter 23. And they were following Jesus about. They were listening to all the messages. And they were listening to John the Baptist. But look at their condition now. Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. Ye serpents... Ye, what now? Generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? That's what John was saying. That John, what John was saying when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, Oh, you generation of vipers, who called you to flee from the wrath to come? And here Jesus was still telling them, Serpents, generation of vipers, who, who can, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Look at uh, verse 15. Want to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. They were still preaching all about no repentance and were still having, they were having converts to their religion but no repentance. It says to make one proselyte and when he is made, he, he make him to forge the charge of hell than yourselves. As we look at all these scriptures, you understand then, preaching the gospel of uh, the Lord and preaching the message of salvation is a very serious thing. And bringing people out and bringing them to the kingdom of God and preaching real repentance so they can be born again is a very serious thing. Because if we just uh, talk about grace and about the love of God and then the people are happy, they don't think about their sin. They don't think about their evil. And they say, we have come.
come when now will not belong to the Lord. And when you are doing the follow-up, you can tell. You can tell when you say you are doing the follow-up, the life they are still living. And then you are still encouraging them, opening Bible and claiming the promises of God. The promises of God mean nothing you know, if they will not repent from their sins. That's what John was telling them. Look at this. We're coming back to chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Now tell me, if you have read the New Testament, what was the major problem of the Pharisees? Why they were not even agree with Jesus? The major problem is, who are you talking to? We're going to be free. What kind of freedom? Where Abraham's children all the time, exactly what John had told them, seek not to say within yourselves, we are Abraham's children. Because God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 38. I speak that which I have seen with my father. And you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. What are you talking about? What well, the children of Abraham, that was their might all the time. If Abraham is a friend of God and Abraham has gone to paradise and Abraham is in a good place now, just because we're children of Abraham, we'll get there. As we talk, you know, you talk, go to talk to people, and you're saying about heaven, about hell, and about, you know, going to heaven at last. They smile and they say, of course, of course, of course. What do you think I'm going? Actually, can I tell you this? Our great, great grandfather was the one that brought real Christianity. I'm talking of Christianity. And they, they smashed all the idols and they came over here. Our father is gone there already. And our father is expecting us. And we're the children of our father and they're in heaven. That's what these princes were thinking. And John told them, your thinking is wrong. You think because of Abraham, you're going to get to heaven. It's not like that. The axe is laid to the root of the trees and everyone that does not bring forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. But did you hear that? The ideology or the opinion they had was still in them. Look at verse 44. It says, Ye of your father the devil. Somebody needs to tell you this. Don't keep on claiming Abraham as your father and the loss of your father. He will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And then it says, and they are both not in the truth because there, was, there is no truth in him. When he speaketh his own, he speaketh a lie, because, for he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Uh, let's come back to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 10. Matthew chapter 3. We're reading from verse 10. Here in verse 10, John concludes. He says, Now, at this very time, also, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down, hewn down, and cast into the fire. Chapter 7, verse 19. Those, those are the words of John the Baptist in chapter 3. Here are the words of Jesus Christ in chapter 7. In chapter 7, every tree, verse 19, that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. As you look at the direct preaching of John the Baptist, and as we're learning how to present repentance to people, we see their condition, their natural condition, we see their condition, the sinful condition, we see their condition, the depraved condition, and in love, we call them out of that 
and tell them, except you repent, you likewise perish. I haven't seen the condition. Let's come to point number two. The divine call to repentance and reconciliation. We need to understand, repentance was not the doctrine of John the Baptist. It's the doctrine of God himself. Because it is God that makes the demand. It is God that makes the call. Ezekiel chapter 14. In Ezekiel chapter 14, reading from verse 6, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. We can see here what repentance is. Repentance is turning. Repentance is turning away. You turn away your mind from the abominations. You turn away your desires from those abominations. You turn away your affection from those abominations. You turn away your heart completely from all those abominations. Verse 7, for every one of the house of Israel and of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel. You see, this is for the Jew and for the Gentile. Anyone that wants to reconcile with God, anyone, every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idol in his heart. It's talking about not just what we see, it's talking about the affections we have in the heart, which is contrary to the love of God. Setteth up idols in the heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and coming to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. That's the wrath, the wrath to come. That is, when people do not repent and reconcile with God, the final end is cutting off and destruction. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived, look at this, and if the prophet be deceived, when he speaketh a sin, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. What's that saying? Somebody comes to you. He has idol in his heart. He wants to do what he will do. But he's looking for somebody, a respected brother, a respected sister, a respected leader in the church to put a stamp of, of, of approval upon the idol he has in the heart. And he comes and he presents his case before you. He says he's looking for counsel, seeking for counseling. He presents it in such a way that you come into sympathy with that person. You say, well, as from what you have said, I think this can be done. And God withdraws his spirit from you. Because you have the mind of helping the person rather than glorifying God. God says, I'll not even tell you the right thing. I'll allow you to be deceived. And for that counseling, somebody seeking for your counseling, I'll allow him to deceive you. And he says, if you tell him something wrong, which is not according to my will. Look at that verse 9 again. If the prophet be deceived... When he has spoken a sin, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet and will stretch out my hand upon him and I will destroy him from among my people Israel and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity and the punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him that the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord God. 
is very clear. He doesn't want us to get involved with any sin. Your own personal sin, you've repented. After you've repented of your sin, you're on the way to heaven. And now somebody else is coming. He wants to offload his own guilt, his own condemnation, his own sin on you. That's what the New Testament says. Keep yourself pure from the sins of other people. If they want to sin, that's their decision. Don't allow them to use you to bring approval on their sin. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 13. Ezekiel chapter 18 from verse 13. We're looking at the call of God, divine call to repentance and reconciliation. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and uh, what's the next thing there? Repentance is turning. Repentance is turning. Repent and turn. It's not just crying. It's not just weeping. It's not just regretting. It's not just having remorse. You know, the people, they've done something wrong and they are caught. Because they are caught, because of pride, that people will hear. That me, of all people, I did this. That's why they're sorrowful. It is not that what I did was wrong. How could I do that? I hate that. I hate myself for that. No, not at all. But they are sorrowful because they were caught. They're sorrowful because I about my name now. I about my honor. I about my dignity. I about the people that respected me before. Are they going to respect me now? That's not turning. That's no repentance. You're just sorrowful because you're ashamed. You're caught in that thing. But look at what God said. Latter part of uh, verse 30. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. All, not some. All your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away. That's repentance. Cast away from you all your transgression whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and, tell me, turn yourselves and live so that you will not die. I pray you will not die. Yeah. Matthew chapter 11. Divine, the divine call to repentance and reconciliation. In Matthew chapter 11, we're looking at verse 20. Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. This is repentance. It says, Then began he to upbraid, to rebuke, the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. He said, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Here Jesus said all the miracles they performed was to turn their minds away from evil. Turn their minds away from their sin. That if this had been done in other places, they would have repented. We're coming to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. Here is the call of God himself. In verse 14, it says now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the kingdom is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Tell me the rest. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Not just believe, believe, believe. God is good, believe. God is love, believe. God can do all things, believe. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, believe. God loves you, he loves you, he loves you. Whatever you have done, you've done this, you've done this, you've done that. God loves you, believe. Look at this, Jesus himself, the Savior. He said, repent ye and believe the gospel. 
It tells us in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 13 verse 1. They were present at that season. Some that told him, they told Jesus of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, what will happen? Ye shall all likewise perish. Not just regret, repent. Not just remorse, repent. Not just that I blame myself for doing that thing, repent. I blame myself for going that direction. Now, no, the, the case is now in court. And the case is not likely to land me in the prison. And then, what, what will happen to my name? What will happen to my estate? What will happen to this and that if I should go to prison? And then they commit more sins to cover up so that they will not go to prison. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Look at verse 4. It says, of those 18, upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, thinking that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem, I tell you nay, but tell me, except you repent, it shall all likewise perish. That's the doctrine of Christ. This is the divine call to repentance. And as that repentance, the preaching of repentance stopped, look at Matthew, Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 45, Luke chapter 24, verse 45, then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and search unto them, thus it is reaching. And thus he behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that, tell me, repentance and what? Remission of sins should be preached in his name. Where? I said where? Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You see then how important, how essential, how central this repentance is. We're coming to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. It says before your sins can be blotted out, before the Lord can give salvation, Cleansing, forgiveness, you must repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Be converted, that means let there be a change. Let there be a transformation that you will not do what you were doing before. And then it says, the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, unto you first, God, have you restored up his son Jesus sent him to bless you in doing what? I said in doing what? In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's repentance. Turning away from all iniquities. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 verses 30 and 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth how many people? All men, where? Everywhere. To do what? To repent. Look at that. We cannot just go out and say, I was not led to talk about repentance. I was led to, I felt the love of God. 
and it was flowing. It was so deep. It was so rich. And I felt it tangible upon me. And I felt, this is not the time to talk about repentance. I'm just going to call the people. Everybody here, the love of God is flowing here. I can feel it. I can sense it. If you come now and just believe, don't worry about any other thing. Just believe you're going to be saved. Sir, that's false doctrine. That's not the will of God. What's he saving the people from? It's not saving them from suffering, not just that. It's not saving them just from a sickness. It's not saving them from sorrow. It's not saving them from being unhappy. It's saving them from sin. They must know the sin they are falling into, and they must know the evil they are falling into, and they must understand that if I continue doing this, I will perish. And therefore you are telling them, you are reminding them, sin is deadly, sin is evil, sin is a poison. And now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because in verse 31, he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering towards what? Not, tell me willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish. But then uh, they must do something. It says, but but that all should come to repentance. It's not willing that our children should perish, but our children have to repent. It's not willing that anybody born in this church should perish. But born into the, being born into the church does not guarantee salvation. Because that would mean like we have Abraham as our father. We have coordinator as our father. And we have overseer as our father. And then just because we have Abraham as our father, we think that's all. My father has done everything, consecrated everything. My father is great in this, our church. If anybody gets to heaven, of course all we as children must get to heaven. It doesn't work that way. That's why it says, don't think that because you have Abraham as your father, therefore you are going to heaven. The axe is laid on the root of every tree. And any tree that does not bring forth good fruit will be cut down and they will be cast into the fire. The Lord is not willing that the children of pagans will go to hell. Children of Christians will go to hell. He's not willing that anyone will perish, but that all still must come to repentance the divine command the divine demand is clear and unmistakable a superficial response from the leaves which does not come from the contrite and broken heart is unacceptable to god god's call penetrates the heart God's call convicts of sin and the guilt and it convicts us of the guilt of offending a loving God. And if that you deeply feel within you, the sharp arrow of conviction pricks and pierces the heart with conviction and deep sorrow for sin. Confession is real with a thorough renunciation of sin. You forsake all sins with heart felt decision and pleading for mercy and forgiveness becomes spontaneous and sincere looking to Christ believing his efficacious atonement grant salvation the Holy Spirit then bears witness with our spirit and we have assurance of forgiveness of salvation reconciliation and 
eternal life. And I pray that you'll always remember how you repented and you believed of the Lord and you had real, real genuine salvation. And the same kind of salvation you had that brought a change in your life is the same salvation you should present to other people. You didn't just raise up your hand, I hope, and you didn't just say, I come into a church, I hope. You had a real change. Why don't you present the same genuine thing you have to other people and God will grant them through salvation in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, we're reading from verse 7. It says in verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Look up here for a moment. You'll see that John was not just looking for a crowd. There are people that forget heaven and they're looking at only how large their congregation here on earth is. They're making comparison. My church is larger than your church. Your church is bigger than his church. And because they are running for number, because they are just a pursuing number, they do not understand. We're not pursuing number. It's not just to fill up the auditorium. It's not to make sure that you know we're overflowing and you see everybody is here today and all of you have come today. You are now members of this church. In fact, we are going to have water baptism next Saturday and we're going to take now your name now. Now that you have come, you have come to Christ. No, they came to church. They have not come to Christ. They are not saved yet. They are not born again yet there must be real genuine conversion after repentance and then your water baptism means nothing they just wet sinners and they come out as sinners and they go back to their evil things they're still generation of vipers even with that uh, putting them inside the river and bringing them out it is the salvation look at the man on the cross he wasn't baptized in water. He went to heaven today. That will be with me in paradise. Look at Zacchaeus. Half of my good I give to the poor. If I've taken anything by wrong accusation from any man, I restore him fourfold. It wasn't anybody running after him. This must happen. That must happen. And Jesus said today, his salvation come to this house. He had not been uh, baptized in water. Look at that woman that came to Jesus and was weeping and weeping and weeping sorrow for sin and then wiping the tears away and Jesus said your sins which are many are all forgiven that's the salvation we're talking about when there's real repentance and then there's genuine conversion and salvation she had not been baptized in water when that uh, happened it is not just you know go through all the rigmarole of church and this and this and then we count them we say now our church is growing Last month, we were this number. And now this month, we are this number. And then go and bring your friends and bring everybody. And then before they even get real born again, we give them assignment. We give them a responsibility. Now, your house fellowship leader, you teach English in your school. If you're a teacher in English, you know enough to teach house fellowship. Come on here, your house fellowship. And how about you? Do you know how to sing? Who doesn't know how to sing? Join the choir. And how about you over there? You are okay, you are a cleaner, it was the local, was the state government, you, you are now one of our cleaners here, you've been doing it on the street, now you do it in the church, and then we pin them down, peg them down with responsibility, so that they will not go, who are we deceiving? When are they going to repay it? Once you give them that, and they feel that now they have arrived, they're not going to repent. Let there be sorrow repentance. All these uh, nature of the viper and the nature of the snake and all that within them uh, and all the occultism and all the witchcraft they're still holding, let them drop everything and really repent and be born again. And when they are born again, it's not immediately we send them, go and do this and go and do this. You are now a worker. But then we make sure they go through the word of God and they have assurance that if they died today, they will get to heaven. That's the important thing. It's not activity, it is salvation. Am I talking to agree people? It's not just activity, they must have salvation. Look at verse, look at verse 8, it says, bring forth 
do it. If you are born again, it will not be any struggle. You are going to bring it forth. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And we're looking at Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, Jonah chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 4. Jonah chapter 3, reading from verse 4. And he, this is the reason why Jesus said, A greater than Jonas is here. Look at this. It says in verse 4, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and the noble saying let neither man nor beast hurt nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink water verse 8 but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth they were sad as if somebody had died. They were sad because spiritually they had died. And it says, and cry how? Mightily unto God, yea, and let them, what's the next thing there? Let them do what? Turn how many people? Everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. That's repentance. That's repentance. What did God do? Verse 30. And God saw their words. You can see the repentance. You can see the change. You can see the turning around. God saw the works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. What's the interpretation of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, on that case in Nineveh? Let's look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it. Look at this. Because they, what did they do? They repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. When there's repentance, there's sorrow for sin. And you're so sorrowful, you don't want to go back to that evil sin anymore. Second Corinthians chapter 7. In Second Corinthians chapter 7, sorrow for sin. Sorrow for sin. Second Corinthians chapter 7. And I'm reading here from verse 9. Now I rejoice. Paul the Apostle is saying to the Corinthians, not that she were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. You were sorrowful for what you had allowed. You were sorrowful for what you had permitted. Ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow walketh repentance. Godly sorrow. I'm so sorrowful I did that. I'm so sorrowful I was, uh, I was uh, thoughtless. I'm so sorrowful that I went that direction for godly sorrow, walketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented, not to be regretted of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. Look at verse 11. For behold, the self same sin that she sorrowed after a godly sword, what carefulness it wrought in you. After they were sorrowful for sin, now they were careful. I can't go that direction again. I can't say that again. I can't think like that again. I can't join those people anymore. What carefulness is wrought in you? Yea, what clearing of yourselves? Yea, what indignation? They were angry at sin, angry at evil. What indignation. Yea, what fear. They were afraid if I did that again, I don't know I don't want to have the wrath of God upon me. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge in all things. Ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. 
Uh, that's, uh, that's the result of real repentance. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're reading from verse, uh, reading from verse 34. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. It says in verse 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not. It says, Corinthians, have you repented? Have you reconciled with God? Have you turned away from sin? Let's see the fruit. Let's see the result. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. We're coming to First Peter chapter 2 verse 24. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 24. In verse 24 who is so self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. That's the result. That's the distinctive life of the one who has repented. We now live unto righteousness. Then it says, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were a sheep going astray, but and now, what have we done? Returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. Now, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. If somebody has backsliding, if somebody has become lukewarm, if somebody is now allowing things in his life, in her life, he or she was not allowing before. The Lord is saying, remember therefore, from whence thou hast uh, fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. I pray that your light will not be removed. Amen. The glory of your Christian experience will not be removed in Jesus' name. Regeneration is a definite work of grace wrought in the soul. It is not mere human effort to reform oneself. It is an inner cleansing. It is an inner work of grace and our repentance and faith in Christ gets that response from the Lord. Instantaneous change of heart, change of life, change of character. The reconciliation, regeneration the beginner of the new life of righteousness in Christ for God's glory. And I pray that the fruit of repentance will be visible in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Then our compass who are preaching to this fruit will be visible in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, What's we'll he? If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Thank God your heart is new. Your life is new. Your understanding is new. And the vision for serving the Lord is renewed day by day in Jesus' name. Let's demonstrate it to the people we're preaching to. They see that newness of life in us, and then we tell them in love, we tell them in love, uh, repent, turn away from your sin. The Lord will forgive and change you. They'll become new creatures in Christ. Souls will come into the kingdom through you. Lives will change through you. You'll turn many to righteousness in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. The Lord has taught us again today and he wants us to be effective ministers of the gospel, preachers of the gospel. And he wants this good thing that we have known uh, to go to all the people and your converse and the people we are talking to. They must, they must, they must have this genuine experience, repentance, reconciliation with God, righteousness, total redemption. There will be new creatures in Christ. Open your mouth and tell the Lord he will bless his work in your hand.